One of the defense's main lines of defense is that th this shooting wasn't done by one person and could not have been done by one person. There were two people at the scene. And by the way, we think they were really short, <laughs> not six foot four as Alec Murdoch is. And to that end, they introduced this testimony from uh, Tim Palmbuck. He's a defense crime scene and blood spatter expert, um, kind of talking about how that could have gone down at SOT 19. Uh, my opinion is the totality of the evidence is more suggestive of a two-shooter scenario. And so I think minimally, minimally, that shooter uh, is getting covered with this material, getting more or less the shock wave of that effect, and more than likely getting hit with at least something uh, that could have done injury, a bone fragment and or a pellet fragment. Therefore, I think that particular shooter, for a brief period of time, is, is kind of out of this. It's not as if they can instantaneously suffer that drop the shotgun, run to wherever the AR, uh, uh, the blackout rifle is, pick that up, and then, and then in, in any kind of a, a reasonable time period, engage in uh, a meaningful assault, an effective assault, able to shoot straight and, uh, and make hits. All right, Dave, that's the theory. It couldn't have been done. The first shooting of Paul would have been so traumatic, dramatic, and consequential. It was not possible for one person to do them both. Yeah, and that's a problem for the state because it gives jurors, as you mentioned, the hook where they could find some reasonable doubt because the jurors are either going to convict him or not based on whether they find that he is a liar and someone who could have done such a horrible thing. And if they liked him, if they felt sympathy for him and were crying on Thursday, then they just have to point to, well, that one expert said there was no blood spatter and two people had to commit this crime. And that's the reasonable doubt. Now, if that expert didn't hold any sway, then just liking this defendant would not be enough. They have to hold their hat on something. And the defense gave them something to hold their hat on. I think the state overwhelmed the defense with their evidence. I think they did uh, provide a case that proved his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But if jurors want to like this guy and want a reason to try to acquit him, they've got it. All right, Eric, what do you make of Dr. Ellen Reimer? She is the pathologist who conducted the autopsies of Maggie and Paul. And I will tell you that her affect is very strange for somebody on the outside. You know, watching this case, now, this is the nature of her job, I imagine, because she's done 5,000 autopsies. So she's gotten to this place where she talks about dealing with dead bodies like it's you and me talking about what we put in our coffee in the morning. But it was kind of jarring when you first heard her on direct exam talking about the autopsy. Oh, well, here's where the bullet went in and here's what a part of the brain matter got blown out. But it was like, oh my God, okay. Remember, the jury doesn't have the same background you do. And I do think this, this matter, though she's a consummate professional, is coming back to haunt the DA, the, the prosecution, because the defense is making such a big deal out of it had to be two shooters. They be, they're they arguing that Paul was shot at close range, that, that they put the gun, the rifle, the shotgun against his head and pulled the trigger. And the prosecution's rebuttal using their pathologist, this woman, Dr. Uh, Ellen Reimer, is basically, that's impossible, forgive me, but, but basically Paul's head would have been blown off if they had done that. And that's not exactly what happened. But Dr. Reimer is like, she can't really bring it home. She's very sort of technical in her words. She doesn't speak like a regular Joe or Jane. And I think they're struggling. Here's just a little bit. We pulled just a, a, an interesting moment from uh, Harputlian. He's the defense attorney, lead defense attorney's cross of her, where he's trying to see, like refer her back to like these seminal treatise on these gunshots, these wounds that are up close, and why... She didn't follow it. Uh, here's how that went. At two feet, is there any gas left, or is it all dissipated like this picture shows? Well, you know, what we have here, if there was more gas, if there was a contact wound to here, it's not a contact. I understand. Wound. The gas, you know, you're, you're wanting me to say yes or no, and yes I can't no. because I have the, the knowledge to explain how this relates to examining the body. Okay, you know, so I don't give theoretical talks or, you know, I don't start looking up in this book while I'm doing an autopsy. I use my practical reasoning and my experience and knowledge. Of mm. How do you think she's playing? 
Megan, um, pathology and, and doing autopsies is every bit as much of an art as it is a science. Certain pathologists have their own uh, sequence of events on how they reach their conclusions. I differ than you, uh, surprisingly. She's quirky. We want our pathologists and our coroners to be quirky. They're not people people. They like to put their headphones on or put ACDC on the speakers and then start cutting and sawing and doing what they do and do their dizzle. That's that's who she is. Wow. You could tell she's a little quirky because she spends a time alone with dead bodies. And don't forget, Dr. Pombach um, directly contradicted the expert du jour who played all five positions on the offensive line for the defense, uh, Mr. Sutton, the accident reconstructionist who was on originally on the boat case. He said that it was an upward shot. Dr. Pombach uh, contradicted him and said it was a contact wound shot from the head down. So we went from a 5'2 uh, vigilante uh, to a six foot four middle linebacker who's shooting down. And I just mm. think it's spitballing. It's almost throwing spaghetti on a wall and seeing what's going to stick. Um, I'm not saying that they didn't posit a possibility that there could be two shooters, but there could have been 10 shooters. And Dr. Kinsey in the rebuttal uh, testimony said it could be one. I can't rule out that there could be more. But the fact of the matter is it, it makes no sense. Listen, the FBI and SLED have confidential informants all over this state. If there was a vigilante shooter or there was a cartel shooting, they have feelers out there. Listen, if two people shoot somebody, the only way you could keep a secret is kill the other one. Two people, somebody would have spilled the guts or somebody would have traded information on this killing over the past two years. Again, all of the evidence leads to Alex because an innocent man doesn't lie on fundamental facts that would have aided police to find out who the killers were if it wasn't him. Very powerful argument. Yes. All right. But here, let, we'll stay on, I want to be fair to the defense, another theme of theirs, Dave, which is uh, SLED, South Carolina law enforcement, blew this case. They were sloppy. It was disgusting. It was poorly handled. They didn't secure the scene. People, people were traipsing all over it to the point where even the brain matter of Paul was left over for Alex's brother, to find the next day, here's John Martin Murdoch testifying to that. It's SOT 17. I walked over to the feed room, and y'all have heard the descriptions. Y'all saw it. I've never seen pictures, and I've told them before coming to this court that I was not going to see pictures. But y'all can imagine what I experienced. It had not been cleaned up. I saw blood. I saw brains. I saw pieces of skull. And when I say brains, it could just be tissue. Yeah. I don't know what I was seeing. It was just, it was terrible. Um, and for some reason, I thought it was my, something that, that I needed to do for Paul to clean it up. I felt like it was the right thing to do. I felt like I owed him and I started cleaning. And I can promise you, no mother or father or aunt or uncle should ever have to see and do what I did that day. Mm. Dave, your thoughts on that? It is criminal defense lawyer 101 to blame the investigators, especially when you have a relatively weak case. I mean, we saw this from the O.J. Simpson trial. If all else fails, just blame the investigators. And that's what they're doing here. And it's expected. But a reason why law enforcement was kind of sloppy was that from the beginning, Murdoch had special treatment. He was a big name in the community. They treated him with kid gloves. And so, I mean, yeah, could they have done it better? Sure. But it doesn't take away from the core question of why did Alec Murdoch lie from day one about the death of his son and his wife? As Eric said, if you want to help these investigators do their job, you don't lie to them. You don't make it harder on them. On one end, you're saying they're sloppy. And the other end, you're saying, yeah, I lied to them. So I made their job even harder. So in the end, this verdict will depend on whether the jurors buy his new story that he waited a couple years to tell for the first time on the stand, that the reason why he was so deceitful all along was because the drugs made him do it. And really, this mm -hmm. case comes down to that. All this other stuff, to me, is window dressing.
Megan. Hey, yeah. thanks so much for watching. If Megan, you like what you just saw, hit the um, subscribe button for more clips and full episodes. I've never met a criminal defense attorney that liked episodes. an accident scene. He's never stood up in court and said, you know, uh, I have no questions of this investigator. I think he did a brilliant job on securing the scene and preserving the evidence. <laughs> if they took 500 photographs, Dick would say they should have taken a thousand. If they did clay prints of 10 footprints, he should have said they did. Uh, they should have done clay footprints of 20. Again, just like pathology, it's an art, not a science. But all of the evidence, even if more was garnered from the scene, still pointed to Alex because the timeline, the, to me, the most powerful evidence was OnStar. OnStar couldn't lie. Mm. It's satellite evidence. You can't say, well, it's a cell tower and there's bad reception. That I felt like I was driving in the car. Didn't you, Dave, on that OnStar with Alex as they were going through it? Didn't you feel like at each stop? Look, you did the tough thing during COVID. You paid your people and pulled your business through the pandemic. And now doing the tough thing could qualify you for up to 26000 bucks per employee at covidtaxrelief.org. Government funds are available to reward companies with two or more employees who stayed open during COVID. This is not a loan, and you don't have to pay it back. The program is complicated, but nobody knows more about it than the CPAs and tax experts at covidtaxrelief.org. You pay nothing up front. They do all the work, and then they share a percentage of the cash they get for you. Businesses of all types, including nonprofits and churches, can qualify, even those who took PPP loans and even those who had increases in sales. You did the tough thing for your employees during COVID. Let covidtaxrelief.org do the tough thing for you and get you up to $26,000 per employee. It would be tough for you to do. It's actually not that tough for covidtaxrelief.org. They know exactly what they're doing. And if you qualify, they're going to get this for you. covidtaxrelief.org, covidtaxrelief.org. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.